I love being here. I love seeing you guys. This is such a good time for all of us. But I want to introduce somebody. You know, I, I, I tag people as plant-based heroes because to me, you know, my, my story is a story. There's a million great stories. There's nothing really special about me. There never has been. And I get to see and meet so many people who I sit there and go, wow, that was a great story. You know, that is just amazing. Well, today, you get to meet one of my personal plant-based heroes. And I'd like to introduce my dear friend, my plant-based hero, Joyce Hale. Come on up here, please. How do I do that? Ladies and gentlemen, Joyce Hale. OK. <laughs> I have a mic. Okay. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Plant Based Nutrition Support Group. Uh, there's actually a woman here in the audience that is kind of responsible for making this happen. She found me a year ago and kind of made it her mission that I came here and shared my story. So thank you, Lisa, thank you, Paul, and thank you, Plant Based Nutrition Support Group. In order to share my story of recovery, it's important for me to explain my journey of illness, and that is that I was not sick for a year. I was not sick for 10 years. I was sick my entire life. And I mean that literally from the day I was born with 103 fever and measles. Now normally when someone's doing their success story, they're going to insert a photograph from that time in their life. And unfortunately, there aren't any photographs of me in the hospital. There aren't any photographs of me as an infant or any photos of me until I was about two or three years old. Now today, if someone had a sick child, that would be a Facebook page, it would be a GoFundMe page, but it was a little bit different because I'm turning 50 this year so that those things didn't exist and people kept that on the down low. And what my parents did is they spent a lot of time looking for a cause or possibly even a label that made sense why I was born so sick. So the first thing that came to mind was potentially trauma. My parents had been in a car accident with me when my mother was eight months pregnant and although she was wearing her seatbelt, she did go into the windshield. They did not find my heartbeat or hers for quite a long time. So the fact that she was able to finish carrying me to term, they found that as a miracle, but they were still concerned at how sick I was. And the fact that it was no longer trauma, because as time went on, I continued to be sick. So I received the label sickly child, which was something they used back then as an easy label, and they questioned if I liked school. My parents knew that that was not the case. I loved school, I had good grades, I loved my teachers. And over time, I didn't grow out of it. So as a teen, I was still sick. So now is that just growing pains? Or is there something more going on with this child? And then unfortunately, as I went off to college, I was still sick. In fact, I was progressing. And it was becoming very confusing and I'm sure frustrating to my parents, but none of the doctors could figure out why I was continually sick. And when my friends would get sick, I had something that would linger and I would end up in the hospital. So in comes tests and specialists to try and figure out what is happening. Unfortunately, doctor after doctor, no one's able to figure out why is this woman so ill. And unfortunately, this is about the time that I start hearing, perhaps it's all in your head. And I know that there are patients out there that have heard this as they have been on their diagnosis discovery tour and a doctor can't figure things out, they get frustrated, and that's an easy go-to, at least it was back then. It definitely wasn't all in my head, but the diagnosis was very elusive to them. And finding that diagnosis was gonna be important because we need to just really understand and to prove that it wasn't all in my head. Years ago, there was a TV show, House. I fell in love with this show, not just for the drama of it, but here was, week after week, patient after patient that seemed so familiar to me that doctors were throwing away, doctors couldn't figure out what was going on, and this gave me hope because here was a team of people that were willing to put the hard work in, and even though they made some missteps along the way, they made it their mission to figure out what was wrong with this person and get them their lives back. Now there was an underlying theme in this show that I found kind of humorous, which was that whenever a team member said, perhaps it's lupus, Dr. House's response was, it's not lupus. It's never lupus. There was only one episode in which it was. And for me, that is exactly what the diagnosis was. I had lupus, and I didn't know what to do with that diagnosis. I had never heard of it before. 
So my big mission at that point was, okay, what do I do? Internet wasn't around, so I couldn't go home and Google it, which probably would not have been a good idea from what I found out since. But I did a lot of reading. I asked a lot of questions. And all the people around me were asking questions about what is this lupus and how do we make sense of it and what do you do? So the easiest thing for me was to find a way that I could identify with the disease and explain it to the people around me that were concerned. And on the left side of the screen is what I was told a normal immune response was. That when the body is um, encountering some sort of bacterial inf infection, a viral infection, the body knows to send antibodies to attack that foreign invader. I, however, was on the right side of the screen, and that was when the antibodies were sent out, it may or may not get to the bacterial infection, it may or may not get to a viral infection, but it was going to attack its own tissue. It couldn't differentiate one from the other. And a doctor explained to me that I could potentially have a sunburn on my hand, but my kidneys could be attacked by my own body. So it didn't even have to be in close proximity like in this illustration. In fact, they explained that it was systemic and it's a chronic disease, that any organ could be attacked, any system within the body could be attacked. And in fact, from flare to flare, it could be a variety of these, in fact, combinations. And I've had every single system and every organ attacked, and some of my flares were weird combinations. And in hindsight, that is probably why it is so difficult for the doctors, because every time I presented, I presented with different symptoms that didn't match the last time I had gone in there and complained about what was wrong with me. The hardest thing to hear was that there is not a cure or a dedicated treatment plan. So what the doctors do when you go in with the symptoms, they find medications for another condition that has similar symptoms and they, pre they prescribe that medication for you. And when you go in the next time with a new set of symptoms, you could, put, could potentially still be on that same drug and now they give you another one and another one each time you go to where you eventually have a cocktail of medications. I have friends that have been on 20 different types of medications at a time. I too had a long list of medications. And if any of you have watched the ads on TV, there is also what happens on the right side of the screen, which is all the side effects that come from those medications. So quite honestly, some of the times when I went in, I might have been complaining about something that was happening from my lupus, Sometimes I could have been complaining about what was happening with this cocktail of medications going on inside of me and all of the side effects I was having. And pharmacists had said that it's really hard for them when they're, pres when they're filling these prescriptions because you don't know what interactions are happening, especially when you're putting it in a body that can't differentiate good from bad, can't metabolize all this, and all these chemicals are swirling around inside that sick body. But wait, there's hope. Something really cool happened in March of 2011. There was the first drug in 50 years that was approved for lupus. Now it says here that it was developed for lupus, but it wasn't, kind of like the previous slide. It was actually being tested for another uh, condition, and they felt that it did well enough for lupus patients. There were a lot of medications in the pipeline for lupus that were being studied at the time, and to get the bragging rights to be the first one in 50 years, this company went for it. Now internally, their educational material was a little bit different than the cute marketing slide that they had there. The most important thing on here is that they had two large trials. And what they found is there was a reduction in the disease activity that was a 14% versus 9% with a placebo. That is a 5% difference from the placebo, and it's only 14%. And that is what they went to market claiming huge bragging rights to be the first drug in 50 years for a 14% reduction of uh, disease activity. Now the howevers are really great on here because they do say that the magnitude of the benefit is modest. I personally think 14% is a little bit lower than modest. I'm going to go with mild at best, but it went to market. It's also not indicated for the most severe cases, and those are the ones with kidney involvement and central nervous system involvement. Those are the patients that are having the most debilitating form of the disease, and those are the patients that need the most care, and this is not designed for them. And it's costly. Costly is an understatement. Costly is ten dollars to $12,000 billed per dose. And this is a monthly infusion, and the kickoff period for a new patient on it is every other week for the first three dosages at ten dollars to $12,000 per dose. 
and here I am receiving my first dose. And yes, I did say that I had every, sy every system and every organ attacked. I was a patient that had kidney involvement and I had central nervous system involvement. And yet I still was put on this medication even though it wasn't designed for me. I had rejected every medication before that, ended up in the hospital because of medications that they gave me. And my doctors realized there was no more hope for me unless they try this knowing full well that I should have been excluded from this. So then the question I get asked, how desperate can you be to know that you're excluded from that drug and you took it anyway? I had skin lesions, literally the whole side of my face that would take two to three hours a day to cleanse and medicate. I was quarantined because that would be a whole day of open raw wounds and I couldn't be around anybody risking further infection. My hair fell out, I had heart involvement. I had been in the cardiac wing numerous times admitted, but I've never had a cardiac episode. My lungs had been attacked to the point where one time I was in the infectious disease ward with two types of pneumonia, whooping cough, and pleurisy. That is how bad my lungs had been attacked. My kidneys, my eyes. I was a photo major. I had a scholarship for my photography and I could no longer focus a camera or even hold it on some days. My blood vessels, my central nervous system, like I said, and that was daily multiple seizures and neuropathy that made me grab onto a wall when I tried to walk down a hallway. I had cartilage loss and I had bone deterioration to the point where the left side of my jaw completely disintegrated and needed to be rebuilt. Now this is a better picture to look at because the other one's a little ugly, but basically what happened is the condyle completely disintegrated and I was told that it looked like a melted ice cream cone. And in order for them to give me any function back and allow me to open my mouth, because it was suddenly locked, almost closed, they had to take a rib bone and a titanium plate and build a whole new left side of my face. It was a nine hour surgery, but the hardest part was the six months of physical therapy afterwards to learn how to speak again and how to eat solid food. Because this whole side of my face is dead. So what's really great about the body is it wants to heal and it wants to be able to figure out how to function. So in physical therapy, I learned that the muscles in my temple, the back of my neck, and the right side of my face, the good side, could all overcompensate and work together as a team and make it look and sound normal to you, even though it's like dead weight on my face, but at least I can function, and that's all that was really important at the end of the day. But in going through that process and preparing for that surgery, I had a lot of frustration, and that led me to the path of advocacy. Because the old saying is, don't get mad, get even, but getting even would have meant that I was turning on my body that was already betraying me. So I had to not get mad, but get motivated, and I needed to get involved. So one month before my surgery, I was invited to walk um, for the Lupus Foundation in one of their annual walks, and I know you've all seen the fundraisers for every type of organization out there. So that was me one month before my surgery, and that was me two years later, and yes, that is my ugly cry, because that was the year that I became the highest fundraiser in the state of Ohio for the Lupus Foundation. I literally became their poster child on a billboard going out of downtown Cleveland. Don't make fun of Cleveland, there's someone already here that's done that. And then I became their state advocate. I went to Washington, D.C. three times speaking with members of Congress. And I also went to our state capitol to talk about insurance reform. And the main objective was not only advocating for myself, but advocating for other patients that didn't have the voice and couldn't make it to, to go speak on their own behalf. So through all these photographs, I look like I'm perfectly fine. But there is a battle waging inside of me that is slowly deteriorating every part of my body and is slowly killing me. And quite honestly, history is repeating itself because as I sat down for lunch one day, I suddenly could not open my mouth. The pain was excruciating and it was on the right side of my face. It was the good side. So I go back to the doctor and I ask the doctor, now what do I do? I'm very much concerned about what's going on because I thought this is exactly what happened on the left side. And they ran the test and they came back and said, you're absolutely right, it is exactly what happened last time. And although we don't need to do surgery right now, you probably have about a year, maybe a little bit more, but you will need surgery on the right side. And I asked them, when you cut through the right side, the side that is helping the left side work, what is gonna happen after I have that surgery? And they said they didn't have anything good to tell me, and that quite honestly, I probably would never eat solid food again, probably would not speak properly, if at all. 
But since I had done so well with physical therapy before and I had been so compliant with the process, that I probably would have a good response, or at least the best that they could do, but they couldn't really tell me that there would be much function, if any. And I said, well, I'm terrified of the surgery, so I need you to explain to me, what do I do, because I don't want this. And their response was that it was my job to keep my lupus under control. I was 42 years old, or I was about to turn 42, and I realized every doctor I'd ever been to could not tell me how to keep my lupus under control. And I have this team of wonderful surgeons that had helped me years earlier tell me that that's exactly what I have to do. And I asked them, how does one keep it under control? Tell me that secret. And they said, we don't have anything good to tell you. We, we know this is what you have to do, but none of us know how to do that, and we're really sorry. And they walked out of the room as I sat there and began to cry, knowing full well what was about to happen in my future. So now what do I do? Well, I have to accept what they've told me, or as anyone with a chronic illness has heard, you embrace the new normal. You accept where you are and where you are heading in that disease progression, and you have to let go of all the things that hurt about that and just go on with your life. And in order to do that, my daily cycle, and some of the people in this room have probably been here, which is you wake up, you pretend that you're okay, and then you go back to sleep. And when you go to bed at night, that's the first time you get to take off that game face and you feel comfortable and you can be yourself because the next day you've got to do that all over again. I had to keep my job. I had to keep my health insurance. That is a very expensive surgery and I needed to make sure that I could be taken care of when that happened because I'm not married. My parents are gone. So I needed to be able to pay for that surgery when it happened. And I also needed to focus on something really cool that was going on in my life or something important that was happening. And that's this really wonderful man in my life. His name is Scott Healy. And it was easier to focus on what he was about to have happen, and that was that he was about to have his 50th birthday. To me, I'm focusing on, we got a cool milestone, take my mind off of what's going on. I'm focusing on milestone birthday celebration. He's focused on his mortality. He's focused on a family history of heart disease, and high cholesterol. And he's realizing he might be at the point in his life where he needs to be focusing also on diet. Could he deal with his family history by changing his diet? So he took his parents to a day-long lecture with Dr. Esselstyn at Cleveland Clinic. Fortunately, that's right in our area. And he came home and tells me about this doctor. Now, I had never heard anything like this before. This was news to me that it's, anyone could do this with disease but he would not stop up, shut up about this doctor. So I jokingly t tell him, you must have a bromance with this guy. I don't know what it is with this guy, but at some point you need to calm down about this doctor. <laughs> I question if he's having a midlife crisis, and he is turning 50, so he very well could be having a midlife crisis. But in the back of my mind, I am wondering, where does one buy a vegan cake? I know nothing about this, and I need to make sure that this man has a really great birthday. Quite honestly, it's a heck of a lot more fun to be dealing with that than what I had going on inside of me back in lupus land. Because what was happening and what I wasn't telling him was my neuropathy was worsening, which meant my lupus was worsening. And I know that I am supposed to be keeping my lupus under control, and that's obviously not happening. So I go back to the doctor and I plead with her and I tell her I would do anything to stop this progression because I don't want that surgery and I'm supposed to keep my lupus under control. So like any good doctor would do, she gives me another medication. And it backfired. It made my seizures worse. So now my neuropathy is worse, and now my seizures are worse. But I'm supposed to be keeping my lupus under control, and I'm obviously failing miserably at this. And a coworker showed some concern because I was four days before my next infusion. And she said, you know, if you go into your infusion this week, you will be hospitalized like you have been in the past. What are you going to do? I said, well, Scott's been doing all this diet stuff. I'm not there, I'm not buying it, but I've read all these really cool articles and all these magazines about superfoods. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring some superfoods into my diet and I'm gonna see what that does for me. So I did smoothies, I did juices, I was reading all the stuff, I was pounding all the electrolytes going into that. And in four days, I felt the strongest I ever had felt going into an infusion. I thought, well, that's really weird. That was four days of smoothies and juices, and I feel this good. I'm really confused now, because what if Scott's right? And I wasn't ready to admit that he was right. 
So there were two nurses that would come and sit with me, and they would come sit separately and talk to me through my infusion, keep me company. And I asked them, well, what do you think about this whole food plant-based diet Scott's doing? Should I be considering this? And both of them separately told me, Joyce, you're doing great. This is the best we've ever seen you. Completely forgetting that my neuropathy and my seizures are hideous and I am progressing. Both of them separately also used the term, Joyce, you're winning. How am I winning? I am sitting here in a hospital with an IV in my arm, killing off parts of my blood cells, killing off my immune system, and this is winning. I've been trained to embrace the new normal, but I'm having a hard time to embrace that the new definition of winning is killing off parts of me as time goes on and I continue to get worse. So I decided that I needed to ask for some sort of sign, and the universe exploded on me when I asked for that sign. That day on Dr. Oz was Neil Bernard talking about how to stop and reverse, or how to stop in its tracks Alzheimer's, and it was diet. The next day, and the following day, PBS, all day programming, I'm sure some of you guys have seen this, where it's doctor after doctor talking about every type of disease out there that are all being reversed with diet. I thought, oh my God, Scott's not home, thank God he's not doing the happy dance and the I told you so dance in front of me, because I don't think I could handle it, so he doesn't know I've seen any of this. And he comes home and says, a friend of mine sent me a DVD about how his father beat end-stage cancer. They want us to watch it. Now, neither one of us had an issue with cancer, no concern with that, but I found this intriguing that on this particular weekend, the universe is apparently shaking me up and wants me to see a lot of this. And in that video, once again, it was not just about cancer, but much like the PBS day-long uh, programming, doctor after doctor all over the world helping their patients simply with a whole food plant-based diet or variations of it. And I thought, you know, a year earlier, I'd been on a medical leave and I had heard that I was supposed to listen when life whispers, listen closely, don't wait until a ton of bricks is dropped on your head. So I had to pay attention to what the universe just told me that um, weekend. And that was food is fuel. In fact, it can be the most effective fuel, just like putting a hot, high octane gasoline in your tank. And I heard that it can also be the safest and most powerful form of medicine, or it can be the slowest form of poison. And quite honestly, I could have been poisoning myself for all these years. I also heard, don't be so frustrated that your doctor doesn't know, doesn't have this background, this is not what she studied, she's had very minimal nutritional education. And then I was reminded in that video that at the end of the day, the medical industry is a business and there is money to be made, especially on repeat customers just like me, who had been a damn good repeat customer for 42 years of my life. So what it dawned on me was, if it's meant to be, it's really up to me, that I can't hold these other people responsible and I can't play victim. I need to take action. And quite honestly, what's the worst thing that could happen? If I did this diet that Scott had talked about for four months at this point, I was gonna eat a little bit more broccoli. I was gonna hear and understand this whole quinoa thing a little bit better that I'd read about when I was researching all the superfoods. And I was gonna to commit to 30 days. I had said I would do anything I was a hypocrite if I didn't try this. 30 days was enough of a commitment, and when and if it failed, I could go back, said I tried anything, and learn how to cope with another failure. Instead, what really happened was, within a few days, my coworkers were asking me what was going on, what was different. And I said, I'm doing that diet, Scott said, that I should try. Their response was the one you said you would never do, and I said, yes, that is exactly what I'm doing. And they asked me to never, ever stop. They had never seen me so vibrant. Within a few weeks, I was reducing my meds. I wasn't doing major step downs, but I was doing enough that I could continue to drive my car, because right at that time, I was being told I was going on disability. I was told I would not be able to drive my car anymore. So I wanted to get my medication down just enough so I was safe enough to be driving that car. And within one month, I was ready for my next infusion, I was the strongest I'd ever been. In fact, I was stronger than on my superfood experiment. And then there was a setback. The difference is, this time there wasn't a flare. It felt different to me what had happened. I basically got knocked off my feet by this infusion, and I realized that something had changed. I was no longer on the right side of the screen. I was moving to the left side. I had built, in those 30 days, normal cells, normal antibodies for the first time in my life, and how did I repay that? I stuck an IV in my arm and I killed off those cells. 
So I decided on that day that this is not something I was interested in doing anymore, that I could not handle one more infusion. In fact, I took myself off of them after that point. And I started taking myself off of different medications and had some discussions about this with my doctor. She was not happy. I was now a non-compliant patient that was taking myself off of my meds. And I realized she doesn't have the background in what I'm doing with this nutrition. So I can't be mad at her because she's not an expert in this. So I needed to find the experts. So hey, VegFest was in my neighborhood. So I went to that, figured I would learn a little bit there. And I wanted to see firsthand the man that my boyfriend was obsessed with. Dr. Russellson was speaking that day and I wanted to see him in person and not on video this time. Something unique happened when he listed off all of the diseases that a whole food plant-based diet could help. The last one he said was lupus. Once again, the universe was giving me a sign. I was meant to be there, I was meant to hear him. I was meant to meet him and have the chance to thank him for the work that he is doing and ultimately for what saved my life. And this really neat woman was sitting next to him and introduced herself to me. And that was Jane Esselstyn. I had never met her, I didn't really know much about her. And she really took my breath away and invited me to an event she was, or at a one day conference she was hosting in two months from then. She said, I think you're gonna be really interested to know you're not alone in this. You're the only person in your life that you know who does this. There's a whole community out there of people just like you doing this and saving their lives. And I think you could learn a lot. And I learned that the, not only is there a community, but there are whole food plant-based events all over the place. Two days after her event, I found myself at Plant-Based CLE, which is a local group, a little bit smaller than yours. And while I was there, I learned about the Engine 2 Seven Day Rescue Diet. The book hadn't been out. There was not a Facebook group. This was not a world support group that they now have. This was localized little test groups that they were doing, and you had to pay for it back then, and I did. And I learned a lot how to structure and fine tune what I had been doing on my own, just guessing game for three, three and a half years up to that point. And then I went to a Two Forks conference, which is Engine 2 and Forks Over Knives doing a collaboration conference for a weekend. And then going there, I met the Engine 2 team. In fact, I got to work with the team. And then a few months later, I got to start working with Jane's team and I now work at her conferences. And in doing so, there's a few things that happen as I continue my experiment. Dr. Russellson had actually helped me escalate and take my diet to a higher level that I couldn't do on my own. And he actually suggested that I get out of the way of my own goals because I wasn't really good about sugar, I wasn't really great about the oil. And he said, you know what, this is really gonna make a difference if you tweak that and remove those things from your diet. I didn't understand the importance of that until I did Rip, Rip's Engine 2 Seven Day Rescue. Then I had to do all the things that Dr. Russellson has said. And in doing so, I finally broke through a barrier that I had never been able to reach, which was miss a day of meds. In the past, if I missed a day of meds, I probably couldn't walk for a couple days after. I would have a major relapse, a major flare up. But on that rescue diet, I missed one day of meds and it didn't throw me into a tailspin. So I did that for a few weeks, missing one day, then eventually it was two days, not consecutive, but I spaced it out and my body was handling this and I worked up to three days a week. I also aligned with a lot of like-minded individuals, kind of like what you guys do with your groups here. And I found that there were a lot more research, or there was a lot more research I didn't know about, resources, and it really helped me escalate my educational process as well as my recovery. And eventually allowed me to start working with patients that helped me realize I don't need to cure my disease if I can get a higher quality of life and help other people do the same thing. So it's important for me to acknowledge who my enablers are. And that's Jane and Rip, our huge enablers. Adam Sud, if you haven't heard about him, look him up. Incredibly powerful story of how he recovered his life, but he encouraged me to start sharing my story when he heard what I was doing and how long I had, far along I had come in my recovery. And of course, there's Dr. Esselstyn, and what I love about this is, this is from last year when he came to my place of work and started to educate my colleagues on how to prevent heart disease, because this is what they wanted. Then they also needed to learn how to cook without oil, so Jane came to my place of work. But the most important enabler is Scott. Scott not only helped me save my life, but all the things I missed in my 20s and 30s when I was sick, he now brings them to my life. He taught me not just to survive, but how to start thriving in my 40s and as I enter into my 50s. 
So these are my reminders to take control and hopefully a few takeaways I can give you today. The, our doctors don't live in our bodies. They don't understand the pain, the struggles that we go through every single day when there's a chronic illness. They have a job to do, they can give you medications, but they don't fully understand what is happening and when you're trying to fight back. And the ph pharmaceutical companies, they are a business and they are supposed to make money. And at the end of the day, the medications that they had, they did buy me time to find this path, but they never got me better, they never got me stronger, my disease was progressing, I was getting wor worse. It wasn't until a whole food plant-based plant -based diet came into my life that I actually found strength, that I actually found recovery, something a medication was never going to do for me. And ultimately, this is my body, and I have the right to take control of it. And when the doctors are giving me backlash about what I am doing, I am the one that has to get up every day and fight for my life, not them. And most importantly, I can celebrate that I am another day vegan and I am not dying of a nutritional deficiency, let alone a protein deficiency, which is what I, told was, what I was told was going to happen. And as we all know, there's no such thing and there's not a ward for protein deficiency. And more importantly, last year, March of 2018, I reached my goal to be 100% medication free. And this is how one of your members found me when my story was run on Forks Over Knives. Since then, I have been able to start working out for the first time in decades. I won a rowing competition in November. I never rowed a day in my life. And this past weekend, I was participating in my first indoor triathlon and I took fourth place. So, <laughs> so it's, it's true and you guys know it and you know the beauty of this diet and the life that one finds in it. So ultimately, it all just really goes back to the basics and we all know this and hopefully we are sharing it with the people that we love, much like my boyfriend did with me. He said he wanted to live a long, healthy fu uh, future with me have years ahead of us. I plan to live to 100 with him. He's a little bit older than me. I'm turning 50 this year. But in all honesty, we've really allowed our food to be our medicine. And I'm hoping that if you're not doing that and you came here today with the idea to explore this and see what maybe one of your friends is doing and they drug you along with them, I hope you heard this and that you can take some of these away and there's a little bit of hope for you. And at the end of the day, I hope you can all rejoice. Thank you. Good evening, Joel Kahn. Privilege and pleasure to introduce my friend, Dr. Michael Clapper. I'm seeing a theme when I look at biographies, I can't see any of you, that if you're a plant-based doctor, you've had about 18 careers, because it takes a while till you find what you actually like and where to settle in. So Dr. Clapper uh, graduated medical school a few years ago, University of Illinois, did training in Vancouver, which means he's a nice guy. The Canadians made him pleasant. You'll see that in a minute. Trained in surgery, anesthesiology, orthopedics. Moved to San Francisco. And then ultimately became the director of an institute of nutrition, teaching plant-based nutrition. And to just keep so nice, as you'll see, he ended up moving to New Zealand for a number of years, where they're just so nice, and they're getting very plant-based now. And then for the past, I don't want to say exactly, I think it's six to seven years, he's been at True North, a facility just north of San Francisco, very close to Dr. McDougall's facility, uh, featured and made famous in the movie What the Health, and uh, hopefully we'll see other people who've rotated through True North. We have, in fact, Chef AJ is one. Uh, but Dr. Clapper now is educating the world with YouTube, with Instagram, with Twitter, with uh, lectures. We're very, very lucky to have him. He has... Uh, the great comment, it's the food. I hope we hear that over and over because that's the truth. So big, big, big Michigan welcome, please, to Michael Clapper, MD. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Joel, for that uh, Lovely introduction. Thank all of you for coming. Thank uh, PBNSG for the wonderful work you're doing and for the example that you're setting about how 
transformation really happens. And yes, it starts with information, but then the key word is support. It's everybody helping everybody and letting you know you're not crazy and that it's a, a wise and uh, visionary journey that you're on to, uh, to get yourself healthier. And you're the ones that are doing it. And you inspire me for all the wonderful success stories that I've heard here and for the template that uh, PBNSG really gives all of us. And so uh, it's uh, me who's thanking you for the opportunity to be here and uh, for all I learn every time I come here. Uh, I was going to do a little uh, <coughs> exercise to get you standing up and moving, but you already did that, so we can, uh, <laughs> so we can move on. <coughs> This evening, uh, I want to make this a practical talk. It's going to go about 90 minutes. It's all packed with practical information that I hope as some of these slides go by, you say, oh, is that how that worked? I never did understand that. Ah, I got it. Okay, if you get even one of those from the talk tonight, mission accomplished here. So uh, this is a little information dense, but hopefully some of the topics that I'm going to be talking about will speak to you. I'm going to be talking about how obesity and weight loss really happens from the plant-based point of view and how you can help it along. And I've got people coming up, man, I've been vegan for five years and I'm still carrying this weight. What is going on? Why aren't I lean like my rest of my vegan friends? We're going to be talking about uh, vegans who are having problems losing weight. We're going to talk a bit about carbohydrates and how we can get a better understanding of what they are and where they fit in our diet. I'm going to walk up one side and down the other, the paleo thing, and uh, give you uh, my viewings and uh, how you should uh, approach this topic. And then uh, topics to deal with temptation, uh, what happens when you walk past that bakery and that lovely aroma wafts up your nose, how do you actually deal with that, and finally some larger uh, considerations for folks who are new to this uh, subject. I've been a primary care physician for 47 years, and during the space of my medical career, in these 47 years, I have seen a tsunami of obesity sweep through our population. It's really stunning, and um, we have become a fast food nation, and it certainly shows uh, the majority of folks in our country, not uh, folks in this audience, I suspect, but most folks start their day off with something fatty, bacon and eggs, uh, uh, egg McMuffin, etc. And uh, the rest of the meals uh, are burgers and buffalo wings and pizzas. And uh, each one of these meals sends a wave of fat through the bloodstream. The fat actually, the blood turns fatty for five hours after eating one of these kind of meals. And even if you take the skin off the chicken and eat wild caught salmon, this is a high fat diet and you turn your blood fatty for five hours after breakfast and five hours after lunch and five hours after dinner and five hours after you polish off that haagen on the way back to the bedroom. And most Americans are keeping their blood fatty all day. <clears throat> Keep your blood fatty for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. You can't be shocked when all sorts of problems uh, start showing up in your bloodstream. Now, what I and everyone uh, in PBNSG is advocating is a whole food, plant-based diet. And we're nothing this exotic. For those of you who have never really, what are they talking about, whole food, plant-based? Like one word, whole food, plant-based. What are they talking about? We're talking about real, live, official foods that grow out of the ground. Breakfast is uh, oatmeal with some fruit on it. Uh, some rice milk or hemp milk and one of these plant milks. Lunches and dinners uh, have big colorful salads, hearty vegetable soups, uh, big plates of steamed green and yellow vegetables, uh, a leguminous uh, uh, feature usually, a lentil stew, bean chili, tofu stir fry, and here's quinoa and zucchini boats. This is not a diet of deprivation. Uh, and, uh, and colorful fruits for desserts, papayas and mangoes, etc. And uh, you can season it up any way you'd like. Uh, we'll talk about different international cuisines. Why is this helpful for us? Because we are plant-eating creatures. We have essentially the same digestive system that our gorilla and bonobo cousins have, and they are up in the trees tonight eating leaves and fruits. And basically, that's what we should be eating as well. 
for people who are concerned that they're not going to get enough protein on a plant-based diet, I will point out that the biggest, strongest, most powerful animals on planet Earth, elephants, buffaloes, giraffes, gorillas, grow to thousands of pounds of mammalian muscle without ever eating cheeseburgers or pepperoni pizzas. All the magnificent <clears throat> uh, uh, muscles on these creatures uh, have been created from the amino acids that grow out of the wild grains and grasses and legumes that these animals actually eat. Now the bodybuilders may say, well, um, but those are gorillas and buffaloes. I'm, I need my protein, man, because I'm a, I'm a bodybuilding guy. If you are that ilk, uh, I invite you to increase your confidence by firing up your web browser and type in three words in the search engine, plant-based athletes, and then hit images and see who shows up on your screen. Do any of these, ladies and gentlemen, look protein deficient to you? <laughs> I know most of these folks, they're lovely people. I will point out uh, Jim Morris here at age 61. And here is Jim Morris at age 71. I'm 71, I look just like this. <laughs> this is the power of plants. Uh, really, uh, the nutrition is in the plant foods. Uh, this is hours of sweat in the gym to create a body that looks like this. But he have no concern. Uh, Plant-based diets work great for elephants, buffaloes, giraffes, and uh, human beings as well. They've got to be whole plant foods. You can't do this on, on granola bars and energy drinks. We're talking about real live foods that grow out of the ground. Now. When it comes to losing weight, most people get lean automatically. Here's why, and here's why you don't need to count calories, you don't need to count carbs, you don't need to count anything, you just need to enjoy the food. <clears throat> it's not about losing weight, it's about eating healthy, high fiber foods. And you can't hold weight on this food, it's, it's all fiber and water, basically, you're, what you're filling your belly up, lots of vitamins and minerals and you have protein. But the vast bulk of what is sitting in your stomach after eating a meal like this is mostly fiber and water, and it doesn't stick to you. You pass it out in big bulky bowel movements and frequent trips to, uh, to empty your bladder. Uh, but uh, this is lean, clean food that doesn't stick to you, and that's why most plant eaters are lean, assuming they're eating whole plant foods. Uh, this is Emily, she's a good friend of mine, and she's a good example of what a whole food plant-based diet will do for you. Here she is uh, in her previous incarnation, eating lots of you know, flour and dairy and oils and meat. Uh, she adopted a whole food plant-based diet. 11 months later, uh, this body turned into this body uh, and her type two diabetes that was making her take 60 units of insulin a day disappeared. So if you're trying to lose weight, your body is never not looking. Okay, you, you can't tell your body, look over here and have a cheeseburger there. You know, like, what, what happened? You know, I, I didn't do anything. Uh, <clears throat> the, welcome to camp. Stop kidding yourself. Uh, you want to get yourself a nice, lean body. Keep your belly full of high water content, whole plant foods, and let the calendar do its magic. You'll wind up nice and lean uh, on this kind of food. So this is square one of, uh, of creating a lean body for yourself. When you do this, as you just heard, when we, we switch to a plant-based fuel, the changes are nothing short of spectacular. I worked at True North Health Center for eight years, or it's about an hour north of San Francisco, and people would come in with the standard diseases, uh, <clears throat> obesity and clogged arteries leading to high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, elevated lipids, uh, atherosclerotic plaques, and a whole bunch of inflammatory diseases affecting lungs and colons and skins and joints. And you get people uh, on a whole food plant-based diet, and it's stunning the, uh, the changes that happen. Within days of adopting the, the kind of diet I mentioned, and this is what we serve people at True North, fruit and oatmeal for breakfast and soups and salads and steamed veggies for lunches and dinners. 
it's just a remarkable process to see. Uh, the obesity starts to melt away within days. The arteries open up. The high blood pressure goes down. The joints stop hurting. The psoriasis skin clears up. The colitis settles down. The asthmatic lungs wheeze less. The migraine headaches go away. And they turn into normal, healthy people. And it's a re remarkable transformation. I'm, I'm the happiest doctor I know because my patients get healthy right in front of my eyes. And it's, it's the best alchemy going. It, it beats turning lead into gold, man, to turn a person like this and like this into this. Man, that's the kind of alchemy I want to do for my entire medical career. Now, these are the most common diseases that American doctors face. I lecture at the medical school these days. I'll be telling you about that. I was at, uh, uh, at Beaumont Medical School at, uh, at uh, Oakland University today. And I was telling the young students, listen, you're, you're learning about all these weird and wonderful diseases, smallpox and typhoid and Tsutsugumuchi fever. That ain't what you're going to be seeing. You, know, you open the door in the waiting room of the emergency room, the operating room, surgery, outpatient clinic, uh, GI clinic, who's sitting there are people uh, who look like this, who have these diseases. <clears throat> you ask the wise professors and the specialists, what are the cause of these diseases? You run into two words that stop all further thought. Etiology unknown. We don't know the cause of them. Well, I used to accept that. Uh, Joyce uh, was told that a lot about her lupus. We don't know the cause of it. But that's become a tinfoil hat these days. We know very well the cause of them. I have a sign in my office that I point to. When people are sitting in front of me, Doc, how did I get so obese and clogged up and hypertensive and diabetic and inflamed? Point to the sign. It's the food, man. It's the food. And as Joyce's powerful, poignant story really relates, the ultimate tragedy of her story and so many millions of Americans, it's been the food all along. If, if someone had whispered in her ear and she had changed her diet, even as a kid, she would have had an entire different trajectory in her life. And the same is true for so many of you now who, whatever you're struggling with, with the clogged arteries and the diabetes and the inflammatory diseases, it's the frickin' food that you're running through your cells on a daily basis that's playing a major role in keeping you so unhealthy. I, <clears throat> I left True North a year and a half ago to devote my full time uh, to going to the medical schools and delivering this message to the students. I really want to help create a new generation of nutritionally aware doctors and dietitians who understand the importance of plant-based diets. Because what these young students need to know, <laughs> is all these diseases are reversible, every single one of them. And the professors, oh, your, your best you can do is manage these diseases. You gotta manage their diabetes, manage their high blood pressure. I didn't go into medicine to manage chronic disease. I wanted to cure people. And every one of these diseases gets markedly better, if not completely reverses, on a whole food plant-based diet. And so I asked the young students and the professors who come to my lectures a powerful, provocative question. Knowing that these are ultimately reversible diseases, I asked them, you want to heal these patients or don't you? Why did you really go into medicine? Did you go into managed chronic disease? These are curable diseases. You want to heal these patients, then get honest and get real with them. Uh, nutrition, the patient's diet, it's like in the Harry Potter movies, uh, Voldemort, the, the arch-villain, the name that must not be spoken. Oh, don't, don't ask about the patient's diet. Oh, anything but that. Uh, I mean, we're Americans. We can eat whatever we want. Don't tell me about what I can eat, what I can't eat. Don't have to answer me, man. God answered your arteries. God answered your liver. God answered your kidneys. God answered your bone marrow. <clears throat> and that's the truth of it. And we are meant to run on whole plant foods. You, you run a diet full of animal products and oils and fats and sugars through the bloodstream, you cause disease. You run whole plant foods through our body, these diseases go away. And that's the truth of it. And these young doctors need to know that and they need to share it with their patients. We have no right to withhold this information from our patients. <laughs> so 
So let's uh, take a little fun trip through physiology land here, and let me see if we can cure up some of this confusion uh, regarding fats and sugars. <clears throat> Our body burns two kinds of fuels. Right now, your body is burning both sugars and fats. We are always burning both these fuels at the same time. But the proportions vary. So let's talk about what these molecules really are. Sugars are basically rings of carbon atoms. These gray balls here are representing atoms of carbon. Here's uh, five, actually six uh, uh, atoms of carbon in a ring. Uh, and this one is called glucose, uh, it's most common sugar. Fats are long chains of carbon atoms. Uh, if they're fully occupied with, um, fully linked to hydrogen atoms, then it's a saturated fat, which is nice and straight. Um, if it's missing a hydrogen uh, atom here, you get the double bond, don't worry about the chemistry. Uh, that puts a kink in the, uh, uh, in the molecule. Um, where saturated fats will stack up like cordwood, uh, the fats are saturated, the saturated fats are solid at room temperature, um, where the uh, unsaturated fats, because of this kink, they won't stack up, and so they're liquid at room temperature, and that's what makes them an oil. We burn both kinds of fuel every day. <clears throat> so let's talk about sugars. What are they? They're beautiful molecules. They are rings made in, in a very poetic way, as far as I can see. They are made from the air and the rain and the sun. Uh, from the air, uh, the plant takes six molecules of carbon dioxide and uh, puts them, uh, strips off the oxygen and gives that back to us to breathe and takes those six molecules, six atoms of carbon and uh, puts them in a ring. And then from the rain does something very interesting. Here you see that glucose molecule again. And uh, here's, those, here's the carbon atoms. But look what's hanging on the carbon atoms. H-O-H, 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 H-O-H. Hmm, H-O-H, does that ring a bell with anyone? It should, of course, that's the formula for water. And so what the plant has done is taken these six carbon atoms and, uh, and for a split second has separated the molecule of water and put it on each one of these carbon atoms. So this is a water molecule stuck here and a molecule of water stuck here and a molecule of water here and here. How lovely. Why am I dragging you through this? Because it, is giving, it will give you the meaning to a name that people throw around but may not have understood. These are carbon atoms with water hanging on them. To add water to something is to hydrate it, is it not? So if you hydrate a carbon compound, you create a carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. This is what the word means. You know, carbs, those bad carbs, only those carbs. I really dislike that term. They are carbohydrates, and now you know why. They are hydrated carbon atoms. Carbohydrates are clean burning fuels. <clears throat> when you eat an apple and you take in the glucose, it goes into your cells, into a little part of the cell called mitochondria that breaks it apart. It <clears throat> there's energy stored in this ring as the chlorophyll in the plant has closed this ring. It, it locked the sun's energy in like a coiled spring and there's, there's energy, chemical energy in this ring. Uh, in the mitochondria of our cells, we break this ring apart we harvest the energy in the form of this molecule called ATP, which we can get used later. And the waste products are clean, carbon dioxide that we breathe off and water that we pee out. So carbon, carbohydrates are clean burning fuels and they give us lots of energy. Now, can we store carbohydrates? Yeah, the plants can store them. <clears throat> the potato plant wants to store carbohydrates to make it through the winter. The rice plant, the corn plant, wants to wrap its seeds in some sugars to uh, uh, give it energy to sprout in the spring. So how does the plant store uh, sugars? It links them together in long chains. And long chains of sugar are called starch. And uh, we eat the starch, and we have enzymes in our saliva and our pancreas uh, that breaks the bonds here and frees up the individual sugars. We ship them up to our cells to burn them for energy. Yay! So starches are sugars that uh, are storage forms of this energy. Can we store sugars? Well, yeah, we eat the sugars, and we can store them in our muscles, not in the form of starch, but another molecule called glycogen. This is stored up sugar. 
that we burn to move around. Why am I dragging you through this physiology? Because as you are moving around, the muscle energy you're using to walk into this room, to sit there and breathe using your intercostal muscles and your ribs and your diaphragm, you're burning stored sugar in the form of glycogen. We draw down the glycogen, and it's quite similar to in your hybrid car. <clears throat> um, when you're driving in the city using the electrical energy of the battery, you draw down on the, on the battery, and then you charge it up, either uh, by plugging it in or by braking or whatever. But the day-to-day -day running around the city energy, we draw down on the battery uh, electricity, and then we replace it. Well, this is the same thing that's happening with the glycogen in our muscles. We, we draw down on the stored energy in our muscles to move around, and then we eat some starch or some fruit, and we replace that energy. And so we draw down on our glycogen, and we replace our glycogen, and we draw down on it, we replace it. It's quite like the storage uh, battery in our car. <clears throat> Whole foods, can, are all plant foods, are rich in carbohydrates. Mother Nature can't make an apple or a corn plant or a potato uh, without using these sugars. All whole plant foods are high in carbohydrates. Oh, no, carbs. I don't want to make, eat carbs. They make you fat. <laughs> no, they do not. They are not evil. <laughs> these carbohydrates are evil. Okay, let me make that distinction, because what happens in the nutso world of, of nutritional media out there on the internet, they take this big brush called carbs and they smear it over everything uh, that, uh, that we put in our mouths, uh, and they don't make the distinction between whole plant foods, which are indeed rich in carbohydrates, and the junk refined sugars uh, that we should not be eating. They say, oh, don't eat carbs. Well, yes, you certainly want to eat these kind of carbohydrates because they are full of vitamins and minerals that aid in their own metabolism. So, will carbohydrates make you fat? No, they will not. Now, we are talking about these kinds of carbohydrates, not Oreo cookies or, uh, or Coca-Colas. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, sugars in their whole forms will not turn into fat. They cannot turn into fat. Na think about it. Nature is not going to blow apart this glucose ring in your mitochondria, grab the fragments, and then string those fragments together in a long chain of fats with 15 enzymatic steps. Ain't going to happen. Sugars will not turn into fat. The only exception is high fructose corn syrup. If you are shoving in the Oreos and the colas, the, your body will jack up your triglycerides in response. But besides that very unnatural state, the carbohydrates in rice and potatoes, when eaten by themselves, will not turn into fats. They can't. So what happens if you eat lots of carbohydrates? If at dinner time, <clears throat> You have three baked potatoes and a heaping plate of rice. You eat a big carbohydrate loaded at 6 o'clock in the evening. What's going to happen? Is it going to turn into fat? No, it won't. What's going to happen is that the, the sugars making up that starch uh, <clears throat> are going to be sent to your muscles to build your, to replete up your glycogen stores. And once the glycogen stores in your muscles are fully replete from drawing down on them during the day, once they're fully replete, what happens to that extra calories in, in, the, in the rice and the potatoes? Your body temperature will go up by about a quarter of a degree, and you will burn it off as heat. You'll stick your foot out from under the covers at night. You'll throw the covers off, and you will radiate that heat off to the air is what happens. It's not going to turn into fat as long as they're eaten by themselves, which I'll talk to you about. But no carb carbs will not turn into fat in that way. Once glycogen stores are fully replete, then excess carbohydrate is burned off as waste heat. Now, why do people get fat, and why do vegans get fat? The most important principle I'll share with you tonight is something called oxidative priority. What does that mean? Basically, it says right here, it's easier to burn these quick uh, blow apart glucose rings than to burn these long chain fats where you have to clip off these two carbon fragments again and again and again and again. It's easier to burn sugars than burn fats. That's the oxidative priority. Everybody got that one? Okay, 
because we're going to build on that. Because it's easier for your tissues to burn sugars than burn fats, if you eat fats and sugars at the same time, or within four hours of each other, I'll tell you about that in a second, you're going to burn the sugar and you'll store the fat for later. Okay? And when you think about it, this makes sense from a survival million years ago African plain type of foraging. Um, if one came across uh, fatty nuts and fruits on the, uh, on the berry bush and you're gorging on both of them, your body's gonna burn those sugars to replete your glycogen stores, store the fat for later. There might be a famine coming. So it's, a, it's not a, an abnormal mechanism, it makes a complete biological sense. <clears throat> so if you eat fat and sugar at the same time, you're gonna burn the sugar and store the fats. Well, look at all that, it's the fat-sugar combos that stick to us. And when you look at what most Americans are eating, it's all about fat and sugar. When, if you eat burgers, fries, and shakes, you're going to burn the sugar. Um, in, the, in the milkshake, you'll burn the, starchy, the, the sugar in the starchy potatoes and in the white flour bun, but you will store the fat in the meat, the cheese, the egg yolk, and the mayonnaise, and the butter fat in the ice cream. The fried chicken and the potatoes, you're going to burn the sugar in the starchy potatoes. You're going to store the fat in the fried chicken and the vegetable oil in the fries. Ice cream is fat and sugar. Couldn't ask for better weight gain food. Even the vegan coconut ice cream, they're fat and sugar. And you are going to burn the sugar and store the fat. You want to be a fat vegan? Pour oil on your pasta. You're going to burn the sugar in the starchy pasta. You're going to store the fat in the olive oil. Fat and sugar sticks to you. How about an all-American breakfast, bacon and eggs and toast? You're going to burn the sugar in the starchy toast. You're going to store the fat in the egg yolks and the sausage. Um, steak and potatoes, you're going to burn the sugar in the starchy potatoes. You're going to store the fat in the steak. Pizza is a great weight gain food. You're going to burn the sugar in the starchy crust. You're going to store the fat in the cheese and the sausage. And again, if you like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, you're headed for a higher number on the scale because you're going to burn the sugar in the jelly and the bread. You're going to store the fat in the nut butter oil. So no wonder Americans are this tsunami of obesity that swept through because we're eating fat and sugar, fat and sugar all day. No wonder we're packing on the fat. And so now we get to my overweight vegans. They can say, Doc, I, I only eat plant-based foods, but I know if they're sitting there 30 pounds overweight, they are eating fat and sugar in some vegan form. They're eating almond butter and jelly sandwiches and burning the sugar and the jelly and the bread and eating the, storing the fat in the almond butter. They're pouring oil on their pasta. Or they're putting earth-balanced margarine on their baked potato. And you're going to burn the sugar in the potato, you're going to store the fat. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so welcome to camp, stop kidding yourself. If you're already plant-based and you're still stuck with weight, look for the fat-sugar combos in your diet because that's what is continuing to stick with you. <laughs> she puts oil on her pasta. There's oil in the uh, spaghetti sauce. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to lose weight, keep your belly full of high water content foods and stop kidding yourself about hidden fat and oil combinations. So if you're trying to lose weight, so well, what do I do about eating baked potatoes? I like baked potatoes. You can have baked potatoes, absolutely. But don't eat them with fats at the same time. When I have a baked potato, great. Put salsa on it, not oily margarine or anything that is grossly fatty. Okay, you have three baked potatoes, but don't put fat on them at that time. Well, what about, I like walnuts, I like avocados, you mean I can't eat them? No, you can have them, but put it on your salad. You can make a nice tahini dressing, put it on your broccoli. Don't put it on the rice or the potatoes. Okay, that will stick to you, that's going to keep you stuck. Now, what about that four-hour thing? Why did I include that? Because when you eat carbohydrate, if you eat a potato or eat some rice, it takes about four hours for the insulin to go up and down and for your body to metabolize it and clear the sugar out of your blood. So knowing that you need that four hours to get rid of a carbohydrate load, how would you plan your day? And this is only for people trying to lose weight. 
If you're already a lean vegan, do not pay any attention to this. Do not turn a joyous meal into an anxiety-producing event. <laughs> um, but, if, but for the folks who are stuck, why can't I get past this weight? The, the strategy is don't eat fat and sugar at the same time, even vegan fat and sugar. And if you have your baked potato at noon, allow the afternoon to go by and have your fatty avocado and nuts on your salad at dinner time. Okay, and there are the twain shall meet, and you wind up nice and lean. If you're already lean, this doesn't matter. So, um, if you are already plant-based, or even if you're not, and you're struggling with your weight, it's because you're eating four foods that are keeping you heavy. Here they are, and welcome to Stop Cam, Cam Stop Kidding Yourself. Number one, you're eating fat and sugar in some form, and it's usually a, a form of oil somewhere in, in the food, okay? But you're eating that fat and sugar combo uh, for the reasons I just mentioned, oxidative priority, you're burning the sugar and storing the fat. Stop kidding yourself. Second, you're eating flour products. You, you want a real troublemaking food, get, if you're troubling, struggling with your weight, get the flour products out of your diet. I'm talking about cookies and baked goods, muffins, donuts, even if they're vegan, and even breads, uh, at least till you get lean. Why am I telling you this? Because even if, the, if they are, if it's gluten-free, it doesn't matter. If you're eating a cookie, if you're eating a piece of bread that is sugar, pastry flour, and there's some fat in there holding that loaf together, holding that cookie together, there's some oil, there's some shortening, there's some egg yolk, there's, some, there's fat in there as well. And is bread fattening? Yes, it is, but only because it's full of fat and sugar. Um, now, these heavy, dark Ezekiel breads or mono breads, you're going to eat bread, you want these sprouted grain breads. Those are by far the healthiest. And we're talking a couple slices a week with a non-oily topping. To, you know, if, as long as it's pure carbohydrates, you'll be fine. But you're, you're, you're stuck and you can't get past it. Get rid of the flour products. They're sticking to you. <clears throat> Fats are rapid, these uh, flour products are rapidly, they, the, the sugar in flour products leaks into your bloodstream. So make your tacos without the, uh, the, the, the standard tortillas, uh, or make your burritos without the tortillas. Use, make, use lettuce boats. Uh, they work really well for sandwiches. Uh, my wife and I, we do a lot of lettuce boats, throw, uh, take a leaf of romaine lettuce, throw a glop of hummus and some uh, carrot sticks and avocados on there, wrap it up, and uh, you can uh, get the sandwich experience without the bread. Number three, you're eating dairy products. They might be hidden, but cow's milk is designed by nature to turn a 60-pound calf into a 700-pound cow in a year. That is baby calf growth fluid. And if you look in the mirror and you see this looking back at you, <laughs> enjoy your yogurt and your ice cream. But if you don't see that looking back at you, just realize you're not a baby calf and you shouldn't be eating this food that is meant to blow you up into a great big cow, which it does. Plus, it's full of growth factors. If you're a woman with a breast lump and you're eating yogurt and cheese and ice cream, you are throwing gasoline on a fire. And the same thing with guys with big prostate glands. This stuff makes things grow. Um, you do not need that, plus it makes weight loss harder. <clears throat> uh, I invite you, if anybody has issues about dairy products, go to my website, dodgerclapper.com. I've got a dynamite video called Dairy Doubts. And we really uh, lay it into dairy there, lay it out exactly what's going on there. So check out Dairy Doubts. You'll see why they are so problematic. And finally, you're eating late at night. Does that really matter? Yeah, it does. And here's why. Timing in life is everything. <clears throat> if you stop eating at 6 or 7, <clears throat> within a couple hours, your body shifts into a, your nighttime fuel mixture. And your body changes its metabolism at night. During the day, most of the energy you burn is coming from the glycogen in your muscles because you're moving around. But at nighttime, most of that muscle activity ceases your sleep. But you've got to keep your body temperature up. You don't want your body temperature to fall while you're sleeping. So how does the body keep your body temperature up? It starts burning fats. And at nighttime, we burn far more fats than sugar. We burn about a penny's weight of fat, three grams every hour. And we burn about a penny weight of fat every hour while you're sleeping. 
Well, your body wants to get into that nighttime gear. You stop eating at six, by eight or nine, it wants to get into that nighttime gear of burning fat. But if at nine o'clock you have some haagen or you have a donut or you have some piece of sugar, well, it takes four hours to burn through that sugar so you don't get into fat burning gear until two in the morning, three in the morning. You've blown four or five good hours of fat burning by that late night sugary snack. So yeah, if you're trying to lose weight, that late night noshing is a no-no. Uh, be done with eating around six or seven in the evening. You can have a cup of tea if you want something on your tongue, but nothing that has any calories late in the evening. So that's another trap that's keeping you there. While we're talking about timing, we're talking about breakfast. <clears throat> Here's, we've been, oh, breakfast, most important meal of the day. You better have breakfast, you won't have any energy. That's nonsense. There is no physiology behind it. It's an advertising gimmick. And here's the guy who made it up. His name is Edward Bernay. He was one of the first advertising executives. He was hired by the Beechnut Packing Company in Chicago to increase the sales of bacon in the 1920s. And he, no fool he, he knows what we've learned in these political seasons. You put a meme out there in the media, and soon everybody's talking about it. So he took out ads in the New York Times and Chicago Tribune, first national advertising campaign. Doctor said you should have a hearty breakfast, eat bacon and eggs for breakfast. Doctor said you should eat bacon and eggs for breakfast. This is what got put out there. And you know what happened within weeks. People said, don't you hear? Doctor say we should eat bacon and eggs for breakfast. Yo, doctor say we should eat bacon and eggs for breakfast. And that's where it came from. There is no science behind this whatsoever. And you know it because in the morning, you could get up, and instead of running down to the breakfast table and shoving a bunch of food in your mouth, a bunch of carbohydrates, you could put on your walking shoes and go out for a two-mile walk. You know you could do that, whether you do it or not, it's up to you, but you could do that. If you haven't had breakfast, where'd the energy come from to walk those two miles? It came from the glycogen stored in your muscles from the potatoes you ate two days ago. You don't burn breakfast for energy. That's a ridiculous concept. It doesn't work like that. We move off stored glycogen. You don't burn breakfast. You at most replete your glycogen stores. So if you want to get frustrated, have a nice anti-weight loss breakfast like this, and you wind up like her. <clears throat> when I ask people, tell me, when you first get up in the morning, are you starving to death? Are you famished? Can you not wait to get down that breakfast table and start shoving toast and cereal in your mouth? Most people say, you know, Doc, I'm not even that hungry in the morning. And there's a very good reason for that. Your body's been in that, been in that fat, rich, fat burning mode all night just because the sun came up. It doesn't know that. It's perfectly happy to keep burning that nighttime fat mixture. And so the, the common sense rule is, knowing that you don't really need the energy from breakfast, is if you're not hungry in the morning, don't eat. Just drink water till you get hungry. It's okay to keep that nighttime fat burning extended all the way through the morning hours. You get a, if you don't eat till noon, you get an extra five hours of fat burning every night, every morning. And this is called time-restricted feeding. And it's a perfectly valid way to run your eating day. So feel free, if you're not really hungry in the morning, have some tea or have some water till you get growly hungry. Then start eating at noon, let the soups and the salads and the greens and all that go till about six or seven in the evening, and then be done with your eating day. That is a way to create a lean, healthy body with nice, clean, wide open arteries. Okay, I hope that's all clear as far as cleaning up the fat and sugar combo uh, issues here and do carbohydrates turn into fats. Speaking of foods that have a reputation for weight loss, I really want to talk about chicken and turkey, if people are still eating this stuff. Oh, it's lean meat, white meat, oh, it's good for weight loss, it's a health food. It is not a health food, it is not lean meat. These are not your grandfather's chickens, not your grandmother's turkeys. These birds have been genetically modified to put on as much fat as possible the more they weigh when they have their throats cut at slaughter, the more this chicken flesh producer makes in profit. 
So they will breed these animals and feed them the grains and other uh, substances that make them put as much weight on as possible. They, in 18 weeks, they get so fat they can't even stand up. And if you think chicken flesh is lean meat, then I will invite you to remember back to the last time you saw someone make chicken soup and what floats up to the top. Welcome to camp, stop kidding yourself. That flesh is so finger licking good because under the microscope you can see every other muscle fiber surrounded by fat cells. This is fatty, fatty meat. The chicken flesh is the fattest of all the flesh foods. And not only that, all the antibiotics and the pesticides and the herbicides that are on the grains they feed these chickens are all fat soluble. So when you're eating that finger licking good juicy chicken, you are eating all the antibiotics and the growth promoters and the pesticides and the herbicides in this fat. Don't eat chickens, don't eat turkeys. You know, let, them, let them walk around, they're lovely animals. Here's another seducer uh, that will throw you off your uh, weight loss goals, um, this stuff. When you walk into the supermarket, even Whole Foods, you will see this display of brightly colored packages and boxes. You know that it's full of salt and sugar. It tastes good on the tongue. This may have your name. In fact, it may call your name as you walk by. You may distinctly hear the syllables of your first and last names. Come and eat us. We are crunchy and salty and chewy and sugary, you like us. This is not food, this is uh, full of fat and sugar combinations that are gonna keep you stuck. It's not really food, it's not, as uh, Michael Pollan tells us, this is edible food-like substances in brightly colored packages and boxes. You do not want to eat edible food-like substances in brightly colored packages and boxes, so you pull out your three-word magic wand pointed at this display and say loudly and clearly, that's not food, mm -hmm. not my food. And walk down the soap aisle so you don't have to look at it. Mm -hmm. okay. um, see it, recognize it for what it is, and make plan B. You want to eat food as grown, like it was growing in the garden. Eat potatoes, not potato chips. Eat corn on the cob, not corn chips. It's the processing. If it was made by a plant, eat it. If it was made in a plant, don't eat it. And while we're talking about saboteurs, I want to talk to you about eating sugar as a food. We all have a sweet tooth. We love that taste on our tongue. And I've got no problem with half a teaspoon of maple syrup in your tea. That's the proper use of it. It's a flavoring. Sugar was never meant to be eaten as a food. But when we are eating it like this, we are eating sugar as a food. This is eating sugar as a food, eating sugar as a food. This woman's going to hurt herself, mostly from the uh, white flour in the bun. Mm -hmm. You don't want to eat sugar as a food. I'm telling you not to. But why really am I telling you this? Because of the Maillard reaction. What is that? Henri Maillard was hired by the baking industry in France to discover the chemistry of baking bread, and he figured it out. Uh, when you take sugar and combine it with protein and heat it, you get the Maillard reaction. The sh in bread baking, the sugar is the pastry flour, the protein is the gluten, and you heat it in the oven. And that, cre that is what makes bread brown. And yay, that's very nice on the surface uh, of a French baguette. You don't want to run the Maillard reaction in your body. Uh, this happens when we eat sugar as a food, when we drink a Coke, when we eat a donut, when we eat a candy bar. Our, that sugar flushes through our tissues and it sticks to proteins all over our bodies. It glycosylates our protein. Then our 98.6 degree oven body heat warms this up and it creates the Maillard reaction. And this bastardized protein full of sugars that gets oxidized, uh, destroys the flexibility of the protein. It creates what's called advanced glycation end products. Don't worry about the name. Remember the initials, A-G-E-S. This ages you is the problem. What's wrong with eating donuts and cookies? Because it ages you. If you eat sugar as a food and it sticks to the elastic fiber proteins in your skin, you go outside, the sunlight oxidizes, fractures the skin uh, molecules, and you wind up with skin like this. Don't run the Maillard reaction in your skin. 
Don't run the Maillard reaction in the lens of your eye. As you eat all this sugar, it sticks to the protein in your eye. The ultraviolet light coming through oxidizes it, breaks the protein strands, and you wind up with cataracts, and you wind up blind. Eating sugar as a food ages you. You don't want to run the Maillard reaction on the inner lining of the capillaries in your brain. This is the membrane that oxygen has to get across to, to feed your nerve cells. Don't, run, don't turn it into bread crust. Eating sugar as a food ages you. That's why you don't want to eat these sugary, flowery, uh, overly sweet uh, substances. I won't call them foods. Eating sugar as a food ages you. If you need a little graphic reminder, the next time you're tempted to reach for that piece of cake or that candy bar, remember her. This lovely woman uh, is about to commit that act. She's about to eat a chunk of sugar as food, okay? Eating sugar as a food ages you. She puts this in her mouth, she chews it up, it sticks to her tissues. Six months later, <laughs> eating sugar as a food ages you. Don't eat it as a food. Have a mango, have some papaya, have some organic grapes. Have, that's where you look for your sweets. Don't get it out of brightly colored packages and boxes, places where humans have mucked around. The main reason I'm telling you all this is I want you to understand what your doctor doesn't and what the TV commercials aren't going to tell you. And I wish somebody had told me this when I was a medical student. That's why I, I entitled my lectures at the med schools I, what I wish I had learned about nutrition in medical school. I wish somebody had told me that our food is chemically alive. What does that mean? It means that our digestive system is so efficient that within minutes of eating anything, molecules of that food are washing through every cell in our body where our DNA lies unfolded. And the molecules in that last bite of candy bar or kale washes through your cells and they play your DNA like a piano. And the, these molecules turn genes on and they turn genes off. They induce enzymes, they shut enzymes down. Every meal changes us on a genetic molecular level. In this digital age, we can't be shocked to realize that food brings in not only nutrients, it brings in information. The science is called nutrigenomics, and it's how your food turns your genes on and off. And, and you gotta stop kidding yourself this doesn't happen in my profession, and we gotta stop kidding ourselves that this is not happening in our patients. This is why they're sitting in front of us with all these diseases. Here's nutrigenomics in action. This, these are, this is tissue from prostate gland of a guy who's got a precancerous condition. These red patches are genes that promote cancer growth. They're oncogenes and they're turned on here. This man went on a whole food plant-based diet, run meal after meal of soups and salads and greens through his prostate. Six months later, these oncogenes have turned off into this green configuration. This is the power of food. You don't need to be a geneticist to understand that the genes that are gonna be turned on by this food and all the contaminants that, in, I haven't gone through it, but cooking meat produces a score of nasty carcinogenic and mutagenic molecules. The, the genes that are gonna be turned on by this substance, as this washes across your DNA, are going to be fundamentally a different set of genes than those that are gonna be turned on by this fuel mixture and all the phytonutrients that this food washes through your cells. These molecules are stabilizing. They're antioxidant. They promote tissue repair. They make us healthy. It's the difference between one and zero. And we can't pretend this doesn't happen. I tell my colleagues, you don't ignore this. This is where premature aging lies as these food molecules turn on the aging genes. This is where inflammation begins. This is where autoimmune diseases get their start. This is where cancer gets initiated. We can't keep our heads in the sand and pretend that what we're eating isn't the direct cause of so many of these disease states. Welcome to camp, stop kidding yourself. And to all my physician colleagues out there. <clears throat> 
when we eat a whole food plant-based diet, these molecules provide stability. They provide antioxidant coverage. They give the chemical message to our tissues, shh, everything's okay. <clears throat> People say, I got bad genes. Maybe you have a genetic propensity in your family, but whether those genes produce disease in your body is summed up by this one sentence. Your genes may load the gun, but your diet and your lifestyle pull the trigger. Now, if whether that disease actually manifests in your body as diabetes or lupus or cancer depends on what you're flowing through those tissues meal after meal, day after day, year after year. Food will change us in two ways. It changes either directly by turning on um, molecular mechanisms like this inflammatory protein, NU5GC does, um, or the, the food will change the microbes that live in our gut and they will change you by their byproducts that they put out that gets into our brain and all our tissues. But food is powerful stuff. It's never too late to get healthier and function better. Which brings me around to this guy. <clears throat> But before I do that, let, let me say this. It's never too late to give it. I've got patients in their 80s and 90s and beyond who had all sorts of terrible diseases. And they started running a whole food plant-based diet to their body and the same wonderful magic happens in their body. It's just remarkable, the stories that I get. And again, it's not, it's not, it's miraculous, but it's not. You know, to eat the diet of the mountain lion, is, which is what most Americans do, is like putting diesel fuel in your gasoline burning engine's tank. And well, what do you think's gonna happen? The fuel line's gonna plug up, the spark plugs will foul. It's the wrong fuel. It does, it's not, what, it's not our, that engine's fuel. And the same thing with a flesh-based diet. It's not our diet. We are plant-eating creatures. But we got this guy, <clears throat> this, my, my, my paleo fellow here. I tried to eat a plant-based diet once, it didn't work for me. My body needs animal protein. And he tried to do a vegan diet and it didn't work for him. And he felt gassy and weak and terrible and then he ate some meat and felt better. Now, either, if he either decides just to make Dr. Clapper a little nuts or else he's trying to tell us something. Here's what I think's behind this. And here's what some of your friends who are having a hard time on a plant-based diet might really be telling you. This gets us into the paleo philosophy, which says we shouldn't be eating anything that our ancient paleolithic ancestors ate, didn't eat. Uh, and because every Neanderthal had a mastodon in the freezer and spent all day eating mammoth meat, so the myth goes, I'm a caveman, oh, I eat mammoth meat, that's what I eat, man, give me, give me that flesh. And there's a couple of uh, blades of grass going out of the mouth of the cave, I'll eat something green, but that's it, man, I eat flesh and green, that's, that's the paleo diet. <laughs> These people only live to be about 35 or 40, that, that, they're, they're not concerned about that, but the, this myth of a mighty hunter dragging that carcass into the, uh, into the camp and having all the women celebrate, uh, this is what's driving this image. What's not driving it is science. <clears throat> People lose weight on a, on, a, on a paleo diet, and they do it for reasons I agree with. They say no caveman ever milked a dairy cow, so they're down on dairy. They say no caveman ever squeezed the fat out of olives and poured it on a salad, they're down on oils. And they say that no caveman ever crushed wheat into flour and made donuts and coffee cakes, so they're down on flour products. Yay, paleo, they're right, man. You, you stop eating dairy and oil and flour products, man, you're gonna trim down. Yay, paleo, they got it. Okay, and, and things get better. Insulin resistance gets better. Cholesterol levels go down with weight loss. Yay, and that's why those first six months, I'm paleo, man, working great, I'm losing weight, my, my cholesterol is down, I'm feeling good. Yay, and this is what you're hearing. But from the physician's point of view, we're not celebrating. Let's get flesh eating into some perspective here. <laughs> Most people in the West eat a piece of animal flesh three times a day. Bacon and eggs for breakfast, cheeseburger for lunch, chicken for dinner. A meal in this country is not viewed as complete unless there's a piece of animal muscle in the middle of the plate. Think about it. You, you serve someone a burger with no patty in there. Hey, where's my protein, man? Where, where, where's my meat? Need, need my protein. Gotta have meat three times a day. Even if you're eating wild-caught salmon, it's animal flesh every five hours. I want to point out to you, dear friends, 
Not even lions eat flesh three times a day. The tigers in the rainforest, official carnivores, do not eat flesh three times a day. They eat it once or twice a week if they can get it. Most days they fast. No advanced primate eats flesh at all. You give this big gorilla a raw steak, you're going to step on it and reach for the bananas. Not his food. He certainly doesn't feed his young animal flesh three times a day like we do. You don't see packs of gorillas running down an antelope and ah, gorging on its flesh. Not their natural food. Well, we have the same digestive system these guys do. No matter what they're telling you, we are not homo carnivorous. We are not the carnivorous ape. Our saliva still has starch digesting enzymes for digesting starches. Our, the metabolic fuel our mitochondria are looking for is glucose. We are sugar burning organisms, not fat burning organisms. Fat is an emergency fuel for us to use. And our intestines are still great long 30 feet tubes uh, like our starch eating uh, uh, cousins. If you want a good uh, exploration, see, uh, go on YouTube and see Dr. Milton Mill's presentation. There's a man, herbivore and omnivore. He makes a very powerful anatomic uh, argument that we are herbivores indeed. Well, well, what about these? My paleo folks will point to their canine teeth. Ah, see, what were we giving canine teeth for if we weren't supposed to be eating meat? Ah, the, 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 give me my steak, man. I got canines. Yeah. And they use this as a rationale for animal flesh consumption. To which I say to my beloved paleo patient, if you think those are canine teeth for flesh tearing, go into the bathroom, stand in front of the mirror, open your mouth and smile. What are you going to notice? You're going to notice that your canine teeth are shorter than your central incisors. Well, think of what that means. Imagine running out to the nearest buffalo you see, jump on its back, open your mouth, and take a big bite out of its backside. What are you going to find? You're going to find your mouth very small, and your teeth are very short, and you can't bite through that animal's hide, let alone its muscle. These are not flesh-tearing teeth. You want to see some flesh-tearing teeth? These aren't them. These are all flat, grinding molars here. You want to see some flesh-tearing teeth? Here they are. If your canines look like this, then go to the nearest butcher shop you find, buy a big porterhouse steak, walk outside, rip off the paper, and argh, have at it, man. You don't need to bother to cook it. If your canines look like this, then get a nice fresh salmon and put it into your blender and argh, do a nice raw salmon smoothie and mm, drink that down. Isn't that appetizing? Doesn't that tell us something about flesh consumption? Your house cat would love that. This, this lion would love it. These are not flesh-tearing canines. What are they for? What they're for is for the food that really got us through those ancient Paleolithic times, where, where every calorie was precious. Some realities that Dr. Daniel Dominey, an anthropologist at Dartmouth, has pointed out. The reality is, first of all, most hunts in the Paleolithic time were unsuccessful. Nine out of 10 times, the guys came back to camp empty-handed. If there was a starving infant back then, this child would not have made it to adulthood. Most hunts were unsuccessful. If they did bag some animal and drag this carcass into camp, there was no refrigeration. It rotted. Within days, it became a fetid, stinking mess that they couldn't, it became toxic to eat it. And finally, when they examined the fossilized feces, yes, there are such things called coproliths, they see the massive amounts of plant fiber these Paleolithic folks were eating, 100 and 150 grams of fiber a day. Most of us eat 20 or 30. So what's the reality? What is this all telling us? What it's telling us is that these teeth and this mouth is perfectly designed to eat the foods that really got us through those Paleolithic times. Because it's clear now that most of the calories brought into the Paleolithic camp and were consumed by the people there were gathered by the women who spent all day foraging, pulling up starchy roots and tubers and starchy corms and harvesting edible grasses and nuts and berries 
and this is what <clears throat> sustained us through those times, and this mouth is very well designed for biting into these starchy vegetables. And with the advent of fire, where the paleo folks said, ah, now we're able to cook meat, then we eat lots of it. Well, news for them, something else that the invention of fire allows us to do is to boil water. And if you can boil water, oh, you can make stews and soups and do lots of things to increase the amount of these starchy vegetables you're able to eat, increasing the amount of calories going to the brain. So this paleo idea that they lived on mammoth meat is absurd. That's simply not the truth of it and not what we're built to do. As Dr. Domini tells us, it's clear now that we were starchivores back then. We are starchivores now. Uh, and if, when doctors give permission to tell their patients, oh, you ought to be eating paleo, man. You ought to be eating keto. You're telling them to pack their intestines full of cooked meat three times a day. I don't, I, the, to the medical students, I go through every one of these contaminants that are caused by cooking meat, the oxidized muscle proteins, the, uh, the, the aldehydes that, that cause mutations, the new 5GC from animal muscle causes inflammation, endotoxin from the gut bacteria of the animals, uh, makes your gut leaky, setting you up for autoimmune diseases, the, the bacteria from all the carnitine you're eating spawns, uh, the so-called TMAO that drives cholesterol into your artery walls, uh, cooking meat creates carcinogens that rub on the colon wall. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, more AGEs are produced by cooking meat and all these bioconcentrated pesticides and herbicides they are feeding those animals winds up in the flesh. When the, when the doctor says, oh, you, you ought better eat paleo, I would say, stop the presses, doctor. You're telling them because it takes five hours to clear out of the bloodstream and they're eating this three times a day. You're telling them it's okay to keep these molecules, these inflammatory, carcinogenic, mutagenic molecules in their bloodstream, hour after hour, day after day, month after month, year after year. And then, doctor, you're shocked when they come in one day and their arteries are all inflamed. Oh, you're shocked when their joints are all sore. Oh, you're shocked when they've got a, a colitis going on. How did this happen? Etiology unknown. It's embarrassing for a, for a science that bases itself on science to ignore the reality of what's flowing through every one of their patient's cells hour after hour is, is, is beyond embarrassing. I think it's, uh, uh, it's negligent, bordering on litigious. So my concern, and you should have that, no matter what the paleo folks are saying, how much weight they lost during those first six months, the truth is, you keep on that diet, you run that flesh through your bloodstream, your intestinal tract, month after month after month. These people are writing themselves a ticket uh, to some bad places. The fats that they have to constantly burn are acidic. This is a constant acid load, and this is hard on the bones, it's hard on the liver, hard on the kidneys. It's fine to be in ketosis on a brief water fast, five days a week, cool, it's a good thing and it recapitulates those ancient intermittent fasts on the African plains when it was five days before you found the next berry bush of fruit on it. These repeated short fasts once a month, they're fine, and it's good to be in ketosis for a week or so. But to stay in it month after month after month, this is not normal physiology. This is like driving your car to Seattle in passing gear, it, and it burns out the bearings, um, and it's hard on the kidneys, all this um, meat they're eating is a big uric acid load. It's going to give these people kidney stones and gout. High protein diets are toxic to the kidneys. People need to understand. They're protein, protein, where am I going to get my protein? The bodybuilders eating these big protein shakes. When these amino acids slam into your glomeruli, into your filter membranes, they hurt them. High protein diets are toxic to the kidneys. Every good nephrologist knows when he's faced with a patient going into renal failure, you put them on a low protein diet. This protein is toxic. And these paleo folks eat protein, protein, protein. But the doc who's approving this, uh, who's approving this diet, he won't be around in, in seven years when the patient's going into renal failure. The patients aren't going to be around when they pass that bloody, the, the doctors aren't going to be around when the patient passes that bloody stool from his colon cancer. That's the problem. The endotoxin in the meat from the slaughterhouse promotes leaky gut, uh, et cetera. Someone asked me how to cause a colon cancer. Oh, pack a colon full of meat three times a day. That'll do it. And all this fat creates insulin resistance. These folks wind up diabetic. 
And the truth is, they may lose some weight in the first few months. But in my opinion, these folks are setting themselves up for a plague of colon cancer, of clogged arteries leading to heart attacks and strokes. They're going to get leaky guts from the endotoxin. That's going to set them up for lupus and autoimmune diseases. They're going to make themselves diabetic. All this uh, animal flesh spawns bacteria that inflames the gut wall. They're going to get colitis and Crohn's disease from this. And this is certainly not gentle with the blood vessels in the brain. They're going to get dementia from this. This is a diet of death. And you should not be seduced by the, the early glowing reports these folks get. They, yeah, they get some early weight loss. But to stay on this diet year after year uh, is going to kill. It's a diet of death. It kills the animals, kills the people who consume it. It's going to kill this planet, too. Western medicine can't keep practicing medicine like what our patients are eating. It has no effect on these diseases. Doctors, that's why they're sitting in front of you, overweight, diabetic, clogged up, inflamed, cancerous from what they're eating. And uh, it's time to go around and tell the students this. So what about this guy who got to have his meat? Where does this meat craving come from? What are we really looking at? In my humble opinion, here is the mechanism behind this. It all begins, like so many things in our lives, in our earliest, earliest time on this earth, at age six months of age. The baby is still nursing at the breast, still sucking on that bottle. And with all the love in the parents' hearts, there is no malice here, your mother didn't know, my mother didn't know. All they wanted was for their child to get the most nutrition and grow up big and strong. But in their nutritional ignorance and their innocence, at age six months of age, that jar of baby lamb, baby chicken, baby turkey is opened. And from that point on, three times a day, animal flesh is slathered on that child's intestinal tract. All through infancy. By age two or three, they're in Fast food restaurant eating their Happy Meals. They are off on a fast food, meat-based diet. Three times a day, all through childhood, <clears throat> adolescence, puberty, their teen years, their 20s, their 30s, three times a day, animal flesh slathered on the intestine. You eat animal flesh three times a day for 30 years. You will set up an, a dependency upon that. The mucus in the gut wall will be the most efficient for absorbing nutrients out of this high-fat, high-protein, cholesterol-containing food stream. The liver enzymes will set up to be the most efficient dealing with the fat and cholesterol and protein coming up from the gut. And very importantly, molecules that your body needs to make for muscle metabolism, carnitine, creatine, which your muscles make, if it's coming in three times a day preformed in the food, since infancy, guess what your genes are going to do? They're going to downregulate their own production of these molecules because it's coming in preformed every five hours of every meal you eat. Well, you do this for 30 years, 40 years, you get dependent upon that food stream uh, containing the carnitine and creatine, myoglobin, all these muscle related nutrients. Then the light goes on. You see forks over knives, you see what the health, you read John Robbins' book, the plant-based light goes on. You come to a PBN meeting here, and boom, you change the plant-based diet. Yay, wonderful, all sorts of good things. But what's happened? You've done a 180 degree change on the food stream. Instead of <clears throat> low in fiber, high in fiber. So high in protein, lower in protein. Instead of low in fat, high in fat. Instead of high in simple sugars, low in simple sugars. Ooh, now everything's got to change in your gut. And all those preformed muscle nutrients, the carnitine, creatine, gone. Got to make your own right now. Most folks can gear up their enzymes to do this, but some folks in the bell-shaped curve, some folks out on these edges here, they're going to take them a few weeks or a few months to gear up their metabolism, to, to synthesize these molecules on their own. And during that time, they draw down on their own supplies of carnitine, creatine, et cetera. They don't feel so good. And then they eat some meat, and all that preform stuff flows to their tissues. Whoa, they feel great. Vegan, schmegan, man, I'm a carnivore. I need my meat. And he does. But what are we observing here? This is not normal human physiology. This is an acquired dependency created by feeding a human infant animal flesh three times a day since infancy. You can create a dependency. So what? 
I've delivered 420 uh, babies, and 30 of them were to vegan parents. Which I, and I watched those kids grow up, marry other vegan kids, and have their own vegan children who've grown up big and strong and healthy and bright. Guess what? They don't get meat cravings. Their mouths don't water when they walk past the barbecue. They are different biochemical creatures. This is an acquired dependency. It's powerful and it's real, and I'm not negating it. But don't you think that this is what we humans need flesh? No, we don't. And this appetite has been fostered in us from eating flesh since childhood. Most people are gonna be able to make this change quickly, but some may take a few weeks or a few months. It's all okay. Some of me, I had meat cravings for years after I became vegan. So what do I tell my patients who I, doc, my, need some animal protein? They probably do, for a while at least. So here's what I tell my patients. If you feel your body has to have some animal protein, fair enough, consider it medicinal. You are consuming it because there is nutrients that you need, not because you like the taste of flesh in your mouth. So find the smallest amount of animal muscle, three ounces, the size of a deck of playing cards. And, and eat it as seldom as you can. Have a little bit on Monday. Coast on that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday till you think your body really needs some more. Have another little piece towards the end of the weekend. Coast on that as long as you can. Eat it twice a week, not three times a day. Believe me, if everybody in America got their flesh eating down to, to twice a week, man, I'd be a happy doc. Uh, everything would get better. Uh, and if you want to have pot roast on Sunday and fish on Friday, I'd be fine with it. It's a tragedy. And of course, I'm an ethical vegan. I want anybody eating any animals at all. But, but from a purely medical point of view, man, if people got it down to once a week or twice a week, it would change everything. And so I urge people to do that, working towards excluding it altogether. We gotta go from an animal-based diet, which we're eating now, to a plant-based diet, and it's all doable. Uh, I invite people to go to my website, drclapper.com. I have a video called Thriving on a Plant-Based Diet, and it's how to do this right, and so you don't wind up uh, with uh, problems from nutrient deficiencies, et cetera. 